Scott Forty from Sports Illustrated joining us, the uh, senior writer for Sports Illustrated. What's the committee telling us about those rankings? Well, I think they did value Ohio State's big victories over Notre Dame and Penn State. Uh, but the other thing they're telling me, Dan, is that they basically just slotted everybody by how many losses you have. The top five are all undefeated. They're the undefeated ones in the Power Five conferences. The next eight are the eight one-loss teams in Power Five conferences. And then you get to the two-loss teams. So strength of schedule, as of now, is less important than how many times you've lost. Give me the one-loss team you think that has the best chance of being in the Final Four. I think Oregon, uh, because I like their chances to win a rematch with Washington or whoever they may face in the Pac-12 championship game. Three-point loss on the road, wild atmosphere, kind of gave the game away. They've looked great since then. They're going to play some real high-quality games here down the stretch. So I think their their strength of schedule is going to be there. And if they get in with one loss uh, to the to the clubhouse at 12-1, and one, I think they can make the playoff. What's the knock on Georgia? And maybe it's not a big knock. They are second in the, in, uh, the country. But first half of the season, not formidable, consistently formidable? I think two, two things. They didn't play very many good teams. You know, it's just non, not a good non-conference schedule. And then Kentucky was the only ranked team they played. They wiped the field with Kentucky, and now Kentucky doesn't look that good. So there's not that much on the resume yet. And then, yeah, they were not, they kind of slept walked through some of those games early. Uh, but now that the schedule is going to ramp up considerably, they're playing ranked teams the next three weeks in a row, Missouri, Mississippi, Tennessee. And then you're looking at an SEC championship game, probably against Alabama, maybe LSU. So they, their strength of schedule will be there. I think if they keep winning, they will pass Ohio state, but maybe not in the end after Ohio state plays Michigan. We'll see what happens there. Give me the, uh, team that is undefeated that will be the first to have a loss of those undefeated i think keep an eye on washington there good team had a great season but they've struggled of late and the schedule wow these next three weeks uh really tough all playing ranked teams two of the three on the road and if they play the way those teams the way they played arizona state and stanford they're going to lose at least once if not twice in that section what's Dabo sweeney saying in that rant that he had on his radio show, whether it's to the fan base, to his players, uh, alumni? Um, I, you're lucky to have me is what he is saying. <laughs> I don't think there's any doubt about that, that, that he feels that way. Um, I think he's also, he may not say it out loud, but he wishes it was 1992. You know, where the players didn't get paid and there wasn't this crazy transfer portal and yada, yada, yada. Uh, but that's the way it is, and he hasn't adapted well at all. That's what he's going to have to do. He's going to have to modernize his modernize his program, modernize his approach. But that was very much a, you need to appreciate me for what I've done. This is Clemson, and I won two national titles. Let's have a little respect. Can uh, Caleb Williams, how does he play himself back into the Heisman picture? Well, he's got some good opportunities starting this week. I mean, him against Michael Penix is going to be a big-time game. And then they've got, you know, they've still got uh, Oregon State on the schedule. I believe they got UCLA uh, at the end there. He's got some high profile opportunities. They've just they got to win the games, and he's got to play great. And to win the games, you're going to have to make your make sure your defense is something other than horrible. Which they're, <laughs> the the number of points they've given up their last five games is the most in a five game stretch in USC history. It's that bad. But I was wondering the start of the season, I knew the defense wasn't going to be good. I didn't know they'd be this bad, but he was always going to have to stay in the game because they needed to score. Therefore, he was going to put up big numbers. I just didn't realize that they're an average team. They have a, you know, obviously a great quarterback, but the team seems average. Yeah. I mean, defensively, they are not good. The offensive line. Uh, leaky, you know, running backs are just kind of pedestrian. They've got good receivers. And the other thing, too, with I, I feel like watching Caleb that he's almost trying to make this spectacular play all the time yeah. instead of just making plays. Yeah. And, you know, you, we've all watched quarterbacks long enough. Tom Brady didn't make that many spectacular plays, but he made the right play all the time, and they won all the time because of it. We're talking to Pat Forty, the senior writer. Sports Illustrated covering college football. Where are we with the Michigan story? <laughs> it's just that, you know, the daily gift. I mean, what's it going to be uh, under the tree today? And we'll see. But the, the central Michigan angle now is fascinating. 
The maybe probably Connor Stallions was on the sideline uh, for the Central Michigan home or away opener at Michigan State. Uh, Jim McElwain, the Central Michigan coach, last night referred to him as the sign stealing guy. Uh, they haven't admitted that he was there, but it's clear it was him. But is he How in disguise he as well? It's like Bobby Valentine being in the dugout when he got thrown out of a game in disguise. So this yeah. guy, he's got a Central Michigan hat on, and does he have a mustache or glasses? Uh, he's he's got to you know goatee, but he's got <laughs> he's wearing sunglasses. It was a night game. He's wearing sunglasses. He's got the Central Michigan coaching garb on. How did he know what they were going to wear? Where did he get the bench pass from? You can't tell me. I'm I'm unconvinced that Central Michigan has no idea how this happened. Let's put it that way. But how much trouble is Michigan and Jim Harbaugh in? I, I don't think Michigan. I, I don't think Jim Harbaugh is in trouble yet for this. He's in trouble for the other investigation. Yeah. But uh, you know there hasn't been anything tying this to him as of yet. The question from an NCAA standpoint is: you start piling up various level one violations, and there's a strict liability rule now that that he could get hit for. But that's next year. Like if you want to go win the national title this year, it's going to be impossible for the NCAA to touch them. I don't think the Big Ten has a whole lot of interest in doing it. Michigan itself certainly doesn't have any interest in penalizing itself at this point. And I think that there's definitely efforts underway to paint this as just, wait, hey, we got a psychopath on the staff who was doing this stuff himself. And that may be the truth. I don't know, but we've got to find that out. But so right now it's Connor Stallions on an island in disguise looking, you know, trying to do who knows what. Yeah, but why would you do this? You want acknowledgement from Jim Harbaugh. You want to prove your worth to him. You're trying to be on the coaching staff. You want to be elevated. It doesn't make sense that somebody's going to go rogue, and they're probably going to paint him like he was a rogue employee. Well, he he was given the information to somebody. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. No, I so say, like, that's my question. Did the rest of the Michigan staff have no curiosity at all? about where Connor Steins was getting his sign stealing information. Like it's just, hey, good stuff, Connor. Keep it coming. <laughs> or was it, hey, how are you doing this? Where, where are you getting this? Yeah. The other thing, he's pretty proud of himself. He used to be on social media and with his friends and everything, talking about what he was doing as far as, you know, mm. work for Michigan and everything. Do we really think that he wasn't bragging like, hey, you know, around the building, look what I got. I, I mean, we don't have the proof of that, but human nature tells me that this guy was probably talking to somebody about, you're not going to believe the stuff I'm coming up with on Ohio State, on Penn State, on Michigan State. Will this affect the quarterback, J.J. McCarthy's Heisman candidacy? That it, I don't think so. Is he getting so, an although, unfair advantage? Right, right. I don't think so. But, you know, I mean, the Heisman Trophy has been called like the Nobel Peace Prize of football, you know, where you, you everything has to be virtuous and lovely and, and wonderful. <laughs> and... There's a lot of stuff going on around Michigan right now. You know, we'll see how they play the rest of the way, but I, I don't anticipate that becoming a voter issue. The uh, last year, the current college playoff format, how's the regular season next year going to be affected? Uh, it's going to be this season on rocket fuel. It's going to be fantastic. At this time, instead of having five unbeatens and, you know, eight one-loss teams we're looking at, and really probably only like three one-loss teams, we're going to be looking at like 20, 25 teams that are going to still have a chance to get into the playoff. And so I think the excitement level for all the fans is going to be more widespread. There's going to be more speculation, more drama of, hey, you got to win this game to stay in playoff contention. Now, on the other side of it, the top teams will be able to lose a game. There's less at stake in individual games. You're going to be able to lose and still get into the playoff. But I think there's just going to be more excitement for more fan bases nationwide. Yeah, I agree. I remember when this came out and there were some analysts said, this is bad for college football. And I go, no, you got more teams and, and the games in November are going to be meaningful. You know, that, and maybe in sept like your schedule and uh, how you treat that. If you have a loss, when you have a loss, if you have two losses, can you still get in? Uh, could a three loss team get in? I think brings in more fan bases for a longer period of time. And, uh, you know, maybe these bowl games actually mean something. Yeah, no doubt about it. I, I mean, I think that, that there's just going to be a lot of uh, fascination with how this thing unfolds. And, and yeah, fans are going to be, I think, eating up the, 
you know, the mock brackets and how they look just like they do in college basketball. And so there's just more involvement, more at stake for more teams. And yeah, people are going to be sweating through all these games in November. You're, instead of, you know, just narrowing your focus yeah. to a small number, it's going to be a much wider number. And then when we get campus games and those first round of playoffs, I think it's going to be fantastic. The I atmosphere agree. is going to be unbelievable. Great to talk to you, Pat. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure, Dan. Thank you. Pat Forty, Sports Illustrated. Yeah, I think it's wonderful. I think the regular season. You know, I know a lot of people said, oh, the games aren't going to mean as much. I think there's going to be more games that mean more.